tap dancing. What is tap dancing? Tap dancing is a step dance tapped out audibly by means of shoes with hard soles or soles and heels to which taps have been added. A form of American percussive dance that emphasizes the interplay of rhythms produced by the feet. Now, the inventor of tap dancing, now most say that William Henry Lane, known as Master Juba, who was born a free slave man in Rhode Island in 1825, had competed in many dance contests and defeated all comers, including an Irish named Jack Diamond, who was considered the best white dancer. But you know, I'll do that story later on because it's kind of deep. It definitely needs to be told. Master Juba, he's the inventor of tap dancing. But you know, tap dancing is believed to have first originated in the United States from African and Irish slaves observing each other's dances on southern plantations in the 19th century. You know, tap dancing, there's a lot of legends with tap dancing though. Sammy Davis Jr., Sandman Sims, the Nicholas Brothers, Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, and the list goes on. But who I really remember is Gregory Hines. He was the most popular in my time growing up with tap dancing. Gregory Hines was one of the greatest tap dancers of all time. You know, his smooth style, the way he used to tap dance, perfect timing with the rhythm. You know, he brought that energy too on stage. Tap dancing was the way he communicated. <laughs> Gregory said it's the easiest way he can express himself as an artist. He made his feet an instrument, y'all. The man's been tap dancing for over 40 years. Some describe him as the Pied Piper of modern tap. Actress Debbie Allen said he took tap dancing to a whole nother level. He was an artist entertainer. He can dance, look, he can dance, act, sing, and play the drums. Wow, talented. Gregory Hines, man. I ain't, let's get right into the story, man. I ain't gonna hold y'all, right? Now look, Gregory Hines was born on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1946, in New York City in Washington Heights, near Harlem. Now, he was the second born from his parents, Alma Hines, and his father, Maurice Hines Sr., who was also a musician. He was a bouncer, and he grew up in the Sugar Hill neighborhood in Harlem, New York. Now, their father, Maurice Hines Sr., he also was a semi-pro baseball player, and he was one of those guys who helped break that cutter line, too, during that time. And Gregory's grandmother, Ora Hines, also had danced at the Cotton Club back in the 1920s. Now, all of his life, he's been dancing, and Gregory said that uh, he could not remember a time when he was not dancing. And him and his brother Maurice took up tap dancing by the age of five. Maurice was five years old and Gregory was three years old when he started tap dancing. Maurice, uh, Maurice was the one that actually taught him in the beginning. He was his first teacher. Plus, you know, their mother, see their mother was the one who really wanted them to tap dance as a career to get them out of the ghetto. She just thought it was an outlet for them and you know, she would take them to the Apollo every week. And by the time, now by the time he turned five years old, him and his brother Maurice started dancing at the Apollo Theater. And that's where they met legendary tap dancers like Sandman Sims, Teddy Hale, and a bunch of other famous entertainers at that time. Gregory said that Teddy Hale was the first tap dancer he's seen who just made things up as he went along that really inspired him. But you know, they met a lot of legendary tap dancers, the Nicholas Brothers, and he even did shows with Cab Calloway. They was going by the Heinz kids and would learn from choreographer Henry Latang. Now, Henry Latang was a tap dance legend and is considered one of the best tap dancing teachers in the world. He took a liking to them. He liked them and he was giving them lessons. And out of 400 kids in his dance school, Maurice and Gregory 
was the best and he thought that they could be the next Nicholas Brothers. That's how much he thought of them. Henry Letang did. In 1954, around the age of eight years old, the Hines Brothers debuted on Broadway in a musical comedy called The Girl in Pink Tights with French ballerina ZZ Jean Marie. Maurice played the newspaper boy and Gregory played shoeshine boy. Now, by the time Gregory turned nine years old, he ended up meeting another one of his idols, which was Sammy Davis Jr., who would become his mentor. Also around that time when he met Sammy, Gregory ended up almost blind in his right eye after planning a vacant lot and he fell on a tree stump and then went right in his eye. He was out in Brooklyn, New York because they was raised between Washington Heights and Brooklyn growing up, but he almost lost his eye, which later on, you know, the eye would kind of give him problems, but it really didn't affect him that much. It's crazy because Sammy Davis Jr., he lost his eye too, supposedly in a car accident. That's what they say. But anyway, now, also around that time, Gregory had first experienced racism when he was about 11 years old traveling on a road in Miami, Florida. You know, see, they was from up north and the deep south was just different at the time. Gregory said he had went to uh, get some water and he saw two water fountains for the first time, one for the whites and one for the colors. And him being from up north, he thought colored meant the water is colored. <laughs> you know, so he went to the white only water fountain and he was about to take a sip, but 20 of his other black cast members that was traveling when that musical play with them stopped them just in time. They had to school them about the South. So that was his first experience with the South. Now, by the time they became teenagers, him and his brother Maurice, they had changed their name to the Heinz Brothers. And in 1963, their father joined their act playing the drums because before, the father was just sitting at home and their mother went on the road with them and would take care of them. She wanted to make sure boys was all right on that road. But the father being at home, he taught himself how to play the drums. And then he joined them as part of their act. And that's when they changed their name. They changed the stage name to Heinz, Heinz and Dad. And they toured all over the world. They were opening up for Lionel Hampton and Gypsy Rose Lee. Uh, who else? Um, they was all over New York, Las Vegas, Europe. Made appearances on television shows like The Pearl Bailey Show, The Hollywood Palace. The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, The Ed Sullivan Show, and many more. They was doing like five or nine shows each day at the nightclubs. They were so good that other acts began to refuse. <laughs> they didn't want to follow their act. And even legendary singer Ella Fitzgerald asked them to open up for her. Everybody loved the Heinz Brothers. Then they, look, then they ended up meeting Johnny Brown better known to the world as Nathan Bookman, a.k.a. Buffalo Butt from TV show <laughs> Good Times. Yeah, he was part of their group too. Now, he started performing with the Heinz, 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 and Brown. He won an amateur competition at the Apollo Theater. And that's when Gregory and his dad asked him to join their act. Because, see, they had asked him to join the act because at the time, in the 60s, rock and roll was taking over. And tap dancing was fading out. It was kind of fading out. So that's why they had brought in a comedy act. But believe it or not, Gregory wasn't really into the whole entertainment business like that at that time, y'all. He was still a young kid and, you know, he was hanging out. He liked to hang out with his friends in the hood. He had a girl, had a girlfriend, you know, and he wanted to pursue football. That's what he really loved. He wanted to be a football player. But he did the whole show business thing for his family. In 1968, Gregory, he married dance therapist Patricia Panella. And they had a daughter named Daria. But Gregory and his brother Maurice were so, they were so popular, man, at that time that they was about to get their own television series too. This was way before the Jeffersons. But you know, the powers that be at that time said, people wouldn't believe a black family on TV. 
Mm, they weren't ready for a black TV show. Wow. That's crazy. They would have been the first black family on TV, him and his brother. But you know, after a 10 year run of him and his brother Maurice dancing and performing together, they split up. The act broke up. Gregory and Maurice was going at it all the time, fighting. So, you know, Gregory wanted to call it quits with working with his family. Gregory said it wasn't enough money, you know, too much traveling and he was hooked on cocaine too at that time. And you know, he was just tired of all of it, just tired of the whole thing. Plus Maurice, he wanted to do more theater and acting and Gregory wanted to do music. And he just wanted to be on his own. And you know, the beef between them got so bad that they didn't even speak to each other for years till later down the line. They would see each other and everything and just walk right past each other. That's how bad the beef was. Another thing was his marriage was falling apart too. He said when he heard the song, Neither One of Us by Gladys Knight and the Pips, he really broke down and started crying because, you know, he was leaving his family and he was leaving his wife. Now, in 1973, Gregory, you know, him, him and his wife, they divorced and he ended up moving to Venice, California. And he said he became like a long haired hippie, smoking pot and drinking a lot and stuff. And he also started a jazz rock group called Severance, in which he wrote songs, he sang, you know, he played the guitar. And, you know, to make some money, he did a bunch of jobs. He like, he worked at restaurants. He also knew karate and he became an, a, uh, a karate instructor. But it was Bill Cosby who loaned him $5,000 to help him get on his feet. Then he ended up getting married again to his second wife named Pamela Coslow. But as far as his music career, nobody really, you know, recorded his songs he wrote and Warner Brothers Records turned him down from signing him. And he was just out there in California, just living broke with his new wife taking care of him. And in 1978, he ended up moving back to New York to find a better job. And to be closer to his daughter from his first marriage. That's why he really moved back to New York. And once he got back to New York, you know, him and his brother Maurice, they squashed their beef they had in the past. And Maurice got him a role in a play called The Last Minstrel Show. You know, doing some tap dancing and playing drums just to make some money at the time. Because at that point, Gregory, he ain't tap dancing eight years. But once he got back in the groove of tap dancing, everything started falling right back in place for him. In 1979, he landed a role in the Broadway stage play called Yubi, and he earned a Tony Award nomination for Best Feature Actor in a Musical. That same year, him and Maurice appeared on Sesame Street. They was demonstrating near and far and other concepts for the kids. In 1980, he landed a role in the musical play called Coming Up Town, and he also was in a play called Ain't Misbehaving with Nell Carter. Nell Carter, y'all know Nell Carter from the classic show Give Me a Break. The following year, in 1981, he landed a role in the play Sophisticated Ladies, which was a review featuring the music of Duke Ellington that ran nearly two years on Broadway. You know, the crazy thing about that play is, you know, Gregory was fired. He got fired after he complained to the director that the play was just boring. But, you know, when they fired him, the cast members, they, they rallied for him to come back. And that director <laughs> ended up getting fired. And, you know, once he got fired, that's when the play was revamped and changed as a more intimate review set in the Cotton Club heyday of the early Duke Ellington band. And, you know, he started to get popular. He was getting a lot of praise for his tap dancing talent. Magazines, newspapers began to write about him, how his skills and talent would shine on stage, which led to him wanting to become an actor in Hollywood. Because, see, what happened was it was actor Dustin Hoffman. You know, he was the one that really encouraged him to go, go for the acting thing because he had seen Gregory at one of his shows back in the day and he told Gregory he thought he had some 
he thought he had some ability as an actor. And Gregory always kept that in his mind. And he started to pursue acting. And, you know, he started to read for some for some little scripts and stuff like that. It was a basketball movie called The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh. Another movie called House of God with actor Howard Rollins. You know, Howard Rollins played uh, in the show In the Heat of the Night. But that movie was never released. But then he finally landed his first role as a medical examiner in a horror film called Woofing because he was good friends with the director. And once he got that role, <laughs> Gregory said he was hooked on acting. Plus, you know, he didn't have to dance when it came to acting in movies. He liked that a lot. He didn't have to dance and he liked that. So that same year, 81, he got a role in the Mel Brooks movie called History of the World, part one. And guess who he replaced for that? He replaced Richard Pryor, who was originally cast in the role, but Richard Pryor had suffered severe burns just days before he was due for the shooting. <laughs> Y'all remember when Richard Pryor poured that 151 proof rum on his shirt and set himself on fire with a lighter. Then he ran outside shouting and screaming for the Lord he said, he said, he said, uh, give me another chance, Lord. I haven't, haven't I brought happiness to anyone in this world? Wow. It's kind of like that Martin episode. That's crazy. But they said he tried to commit suicide or something. But anyway, but that's how he got that road. Gregory got the road because Richard Pryor had burned himself, set himself on fire the day before or something. Then, then he got in a movie with Chevy Chase and Sigourney Weaver called deal of the century and him and his wife you know they had this son that same year named zachary in 1984 he starred in the movie titled the cotton club alongside his brother maurice hines as sandman williams and clay williams i think they portrayed the uh the nicholas brothers if i'm not mistaken in that movie but you know both of them got the roles because see because look they really wanted cab calloway and richard pryor for that movie but richard pryor had committed to the uh superman 3 and the toy movie at the time plus you know gregory it was good for them too because gregory and maurice they grew up performing at the cotton club and plus their grandmother used to be a showgirl at the real cotton club back in the 1920s the cotton club movie man that movie is really it's really a gangster movie about dutch schultz and all the mafia stuff during the 1920s, but Gregory and Maurice, huh, they kind of stole the show in that movie, man. All that amazing acting and dancing they was doing in that movie, and, you know, that caused some tension and controversy. And you know what? The director cut out a lot of their scenes in that movie to focus more on the white gangsters in the movie. Wow. They cut out a lot of black cast members, too, for that movie. You know, you know Lawrence Fishburne portrayed black gangster uh, Bumpy Johnson in that movie. But, you know, that movie, Maurice and Gregory, it was real for them because the scenes were, they were brothers in the movie and in real life, they had broke up as a group. It was real life for them. They had to relive it for real. The arguing and all that in the movie scene was real. And when the director said cut, they were still really, they was crying for real. And their parents were crying on the set. It was just art imitating life. They say the movie took five years to make, but that's one of my favorite movies, man, right there. The Cotton Club. So make sure y'all check that out when y'all get a chance. Now, in 1985, he played Raymond Greenwood in a movie called White Nights, which is about two dancers who must work together to escape the Soviet Union. That movie, Gregory got a lot of praise for his tap dancing in that movie. His dancing was phenomenal in that movie. In 1986, he co-starred with actor Billy Crystal in the cop movie called Running Scared and won the Image Award for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Motion Picture. That was Billy Crystal and Gregory's first time ever being a lead in a role. In an interview, right, Gregory said that he often looked for roles written for white actors, preferring their greater scope and dynamics. Now, another thing Gregory was good at was singing. 
And you know, like I mentioned earlier, right, back in the 70s, during his hippie days, he had a band, he used to write songs, but no one ever gave him a chance. But during 1985, he had met Luther Vandross, the great late Luther Vandross. He met Luther. Now, how he met Luther, right, Gregory said Luther saw him singing on a Saturday Night Live rerun and got in contact with him and said he wanted to produce produce for him because he liked something in his voice and you know him and luther started working together and they released a duet song called there's nothing better than love which hit number one on the billboard r&b charts i love that song too man i had no idea that gregory hines was featured on that song that's crazy i've been hearing that song for years but that song was on that was on Luther Vandross' uh, fifth album titled Give Me a Reason. You know, th that album had songs like Stop the Love, which also hit number one. Had the song So Amazing. So Amazing is one of Luther's greatest songs to me. And you know, Luther got Gregory a record deal with Epic Records. And he released his only album, which was self-titled. So y'all make sure y'all check out Gregory uh, Hines' album too. Now, in 1988, he was in a movie called Off Limits in which he plays a plainclothes military detective in Saigon, Vietnam, investigating a prostitute's murder. You know, the director for that movie was kind of hesitant giving him that role because he had never seen Gregory in an action-packed role like that before. But, hey, he beat out actor Carl Weathers for that role. Now, in 1989, he played Max Washington. And the classic movie, Tap, with Sammy Davis Jr., Savion Glover, and Suzanne Douglas. You know, Savion Glover was only 14 years old at the time. And Gregory was his mentor. And look, <laughs> Gregory said Savion could do things that he couldn't even do. And believe he's the greatest tap dancer ever to put on a pair of shoes. Wow. That's what Gregory said about Savion. But you know, I love the movie Tap. Plus... You know, it was the last movie that Sammy Davis Jr. appeared in. And you had all the tap dance legends in there, too. Bunny Briggs, Sandman Sims, Harold Nicholas from the Nicholas Brothers, Jimmy Slide, and many more. They was doing, hey, them old legends, they was doing some unbelievable tap dancing moves for their age in that movie, too, man. Now, that same year, 1989, right, he created and hosted Gregory Hines' Tap Dance in America, which was a PBS television special that featured veteran tap dancers, established tap dance companies, and the next generation of tap dancers. He also was an advocate for tap dancing and successfully lobbied for the creation of National Tap Dance Day, which is now celebrated every year on May 25th. It's celebrated every year on May 25th, which is Bill Bojangles Robinson's birthday. It's celebrated in eight other nations too. Wow. I remember uh Bojangles. He used to be on the TV show my grandma used to watch uh the Shirley Temple back in the day. Curly Sue uh Shirley Temple joint. Bojangles. But anyway, so Gregory, you know, he was also on the board of directors of Manhattan Tap, the Jazz Tap Ensemble and the American Tap Foundation formerly the American Tap Dance Orchestra. And at Sammy Davis Jr.'s 60th anniversary celebration, him and Sammy tap danced together on stage. And you know what? Gregory knelt down on the floor and kissed Sammy's shoes. He kissed his tap shoes, man. That was his idol right there, his mentor. You know, Sammy died on May 16th, 1990. He died from, uh, he was 64 years old. He had throat cancer. And, you know, Gregory was very emotional at the funeral. Gregory said before he died, he went to see Sammy Davis Jr. And when he said goodbye to him, turned and walked towards the door. Just before he opened the door, he looked around and Sammy, he said Sammy picked up an imaginary ball and threw it towards him for him to carry on the legacy he left off. Wow. Sammy was telling him to keep the tap dancing alive, man. In 1991, he was in a movie called Eve of Destruction, and that same year, he played Goldie 
in the classic 1991 movie called A Rage in Harlem, directed by Bill Duke. That's my movie right there. You know, even though some say uh, they felt like it was a copycat of Harlem Nights, but I can watch A Rage in Harlem over and over again, man. You know what's crazy? They say uh, Robin Givens beat out Vanessa Williams, Pam Greer, and Jasmine Guy for the female lead role in that movie. Hmm. Now, in 1992, Gregory, uh, he won a Tony Award as Best Actor in a Musical for his portrayal of Jelly Roll Morton, and he also won a Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Actor in a Musical, too. In 1994, he wanted to be more behind the cameras, you know, more behind the scenes, and he made his directorial debut for the movie called White Man's Burden, which is an interracial movie about a white paralegal man that becomes attracted to a black teenager girl while tutoring her. Now, that same year, he landed a role as Sergeant First Class Cass in a movie called Renaissance Man. In 1995, he starred in another classic movie, Waiting to Excel, as Marvin King, Gloria's uh, neighbor. You know, Gloria, played by uh, Loretta Devine, fell in love with him in the movie you know uh loretta divine in an uncensored interview on tv she said gregory hines on her first day of shooting had roses everywhere for her and she always bragged on him because nobody else ever did that she said gregory told her as soon as the movie is over she got to lose weight to move on to the next category wow but, you know, Angela Bass, look, Angela Bass has said there was supposed to be a, a, a Waiting to Excel sequel, but they lost Whitney and now they lost Gregory. Wow, that's crazy. Now, in 1996, he had a role in The Preacher's Wife starring Denzel Washington and uh, Whitney Houston. Denzel, <laughs> little fact about that, right? Denzel said uh he first considered Julia Roberts for the role, but then quickly turned to Whitney Houston. Wow, that's crazy. But Gregory played Joe Hamilton in that movie. Now, that same year, in 96, he also appeared in the movie uh, The Cherokee Kid with comedian Sinbad. In 1997, he finally got his own sitcom. <laughs> Gregory got his own sitcom called The Gregory Hines Show. And he played the character Ben Stevenson, a single father trying to raise his 12-year-old son. But, you know, the show only ran for one season on CBS and was canceled after 16 episodes. So, but a lot of episodes are on YouTube. I thought it was a great show. I thought it was a great show. Y'all can catch some of the episodes on YouTube when y'all get a chance. Now, in 1998, he played in a movie called The Tick Code. And also... That same year, him and his wife, Pamela Coslow, ended up getting divorced. In 1999, he had a role on a show called Will and Grace. He was, he was Will's boss, Ben Doucette, which won an Emmy Award for NBC for Best Comedy Series. But, you know, he ended up leaving that show early to direct a movie called Red Sneakers for Showtime at the time. Now, a lot of people might not know this, though. He was the voice of Big Bill in the Nick Jr. Uh, animated children's series called Little, Little Bill. Y'all remember that show Little Bill? That was created by uh, Bill Cosby. And he won a Daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Performer in an animated program for the role on that show in 2003. Now, he also played another idol of his growing up, which was Bojangles. He played Bill Bojangles Robinson in the movie Bojangles. And for that role, he won the 2002 Image Award Outstanding Actor in a television movie, miniseries, or a dramatic special. 2002, him and uh, Bernadette Peters co-hosted the 56th Annual Tony Awards. But on August 9th, 2003, Gregory Hines died of liver cancer, y'all liver cancer they say he died on his way to the hospital you know only close friends and family knew he had cancer and the doctors told him he had 
He had about two months to live. But you know, Gregory was a fighter and he lasted 13 months before he lost this battle. At the time, he was engaged to bodybuilder Negrita Jade. And he was also teaching people how to tap dance in classes. You know, on January 28, 2019, the United States Postal Service honored Gregory Hines with a postage stamp as part of his Black Heritage series. Wow, that's a that's a big achievement right there. Wow, that's crazy. And you know, his brother Maurice Hines is still living today, and he just released a documentary called Maurice Hines, Bring Them Back, which has a lot of information about him and Gregory Hines' life growing up in the business. You know, Gregory Hines' kids, too, you know, his daughter and son, they also work in the industry and doing things in the entertainment world, too. And, you know, there's a couple books out about his life y'all can check out, but... His protege, Savion Glover, is definitely carrying on his legacy. He's like the biggest tap dancer in the world right now. So I know Gregory is looking down, smiling, and very proud of him for keeping that legacy alive. Wow. Man, he was 57 years old. Young, man. 57 years old. Rest in peace. Tap dance legend. Gregory Hines.